Good evening, and first of all, a very happy new year to you all. I wonder what 2005 is going to bring us. I'm sure it's going to be exciting. Well, for our sky notes, Saturn is in the evening sky, and that's going to be the subject of our main programme tonight. But also, we have a comet, Chris. That's right, the comet is Macolt, so it's just about a naked eye object. Not particularly spectacular, certainly not a hale bop, unfortunately. But it's visible, uh, passing up through Eridanus, and on the 7th of January, it'll be near the Pleiades. Should be a really nice target for astrophotographers. It'll be around for some time, so it won't be bright, but it's certainly very interesting. And as you say, Saturn's in Gemini, quite obvious, the colour is clear with the naked eye, and then t any telescope will show you the rings and begin to see detail on the planet. Um, the, we've had some truly spectacular photos as well. This one from Damien Peach, and then this one from Jamie Cooper, showing the moons. Including, I think, Titan, where the subject now of our main programme tonight. That's right. And Mars, too, is very much in the news. That's not well placed at the moment, but the two probes, Spirit and Opportunity, are roaming around Mars, sending back these magnificent pictures, and the most important thing of all, we now know definitely, Mars was once a watery world. What's clear from Spirit and Opportunity is not just that there was water, but it was substantial and it was widespread. The two probes were at very different sites, and they both detected very clear signs of substantial oceans of water sometime in the recent past. And not just that, results from Mars Express and other satellites have shown that volcanism is also very recent. So sources of heat um, within the last million years, perhaps, existed on Mars. Uh, now, going far beyond our solar system, there are news about galaxies. That's right. We've been trying to understand the process by which galaxies evolve for nearly a hundred years now, since Hubble's tuning fork diagram tried to split galaxies into spirals and ellipticals. And now we're still getting surprises. NASA's satellite, GALAX, an ultraviolet telescope, looking at galaxy evolution, has discovered a new class of galaxies, ultraviolet luminous galaxies. Now, there are about 30 of these. They're about the size of the Milky Way, but they're very recent. They've only f they formed within the last billion or so years. Completely unexpected. We thought all the massive galaxies formed a long time ago. Our universe was past that, and now it would only be the dwarfs that were beginning to form stars. And yet, we see... Surprisingly, these living fossils, these large, newly formed galaxies, which give us a chance to study the process of galaxy evolution close up. Chris, thank you very much. And now on to our main programme. After a journey lasting for more than seven years, the Cassini probe has finally reached its target, Saturn, and is now going on the planet. On Christmas Day, it released the Huygens probe, which is on its way down to landing on the satellite Titan on January the 14th. And no further manoeuvres are possible. And actually, Huygens has been photographed from Cassini. And here's an amazing picture. What Huygens is going to find, we don't know. But meanwhile, there's plenty of results from Saturn itself. And I'm delighted to be joined now by three distinguished guests. Professor Michel Doherty from the Imperial College London. Dr. Andrew Coates of the Mullard Space Science Laboratory, and Professor Carl Murray from Queen Mary College, all of whom are closely concerned with this program. So, can I come first of all to you, Carl? Well, for we've learnt more about Saturn than we've heard before. That's right. We waited a long time for this mission to get to Saturn, and we had the wonderful Saturn orbit insertion back at the beginning of July, where we had our closest ever look at, at the rings, and we've had six months now in orbit around Saturn, looking at satellites, rings, looking at the planet. The rings are amazing things, also made of entirely of ice particles, and not nearly so straightforward as we, as we once thought. Yes, we had a glimpse with the, the two Voyager spacecraft back in the early 1980s, but the look that we got with Cassini, particularly at Saturn orbit insertion, was, was really quite incredible. We see lots of structure in the rings that wasn't predicted to be there, beautiful waves at the edges of some of the gaps in the rings. And of particular interest to me was the, the F ring, which orbits uh, just outside the main ring system. This Voyager had showed his incredible twisted braided appearance, and we got a chance to see that with, with the Cassini images. How thick are the rings? Well, we don't really know. It may be down to less than a kilometre, perhaps only a few tens of metres, because it's very difficult to determine from the Earth. It may be just the thickness of the, the largest ring particle. 
which may be um, you know, tens, hundreds of meters in size. We know that they are warped as well by some of the moons that orbit outside, so maybe it's that, that degree of warping that determines the final thickness. We know that all the outer giants have got rings, but Saturn and then class of their own, how were they formed? Well, the best suggestion is that there was a passing comet, but not a sort of ordinary you know, Halley-type comet. This would have to be a giant comet which came too close to the planet, was perhaps tidally disrupted, and then that produced the, the ring system, because we know the ring system is icy, and we know that comets are basically icy objects. So that's the best guess. Or a broken up small icy satellite? That's possible too, um, but if you put all the rings together, you would get a, a satellite that's about the size of, of Mimas, so something that's about 400 kilometers across. So that's, that's a big object, and um, you'd have to get a mechanism to, to pull it in towards the planet. And tides can do that in certain circumstances, so it's possibly a, a broken up moon. But you need a, 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 a large source of an icy object, and we, we have problems with this. Mm. Uh, the main problem at the minute is that Saturn's rings seem to be, to be far too young. They could only survive for, for, on the basis of what we know about rings interacting with, with small moons for about 200 million years at the most and that's an uncomfortably small fraction of the age of the solar system. And so, just as we don't place ourselves at a special point in space, and um, there's nothing special about our planet or our sun, we don't place ourselves at a special point in time when we just happen to be around to see Saturn's rings, beautiful though they are. So we need to understand how rings come and go in the solar system, and that's something that Cassini can help us do. How long will Cassini go on sending back data? Well, the mission will go on for another three and a half years in the primary mission. Um, so the Huygens probe mission is, is happening very shortly on the 14th of January. But after that, there's another three and a half years of, uh, of, of orbits to go. And we're hoping for an extended mission as well, because we're discovering all sorts of interesting things. From our point of view, one of the interesting things we're discovering um, is the aurora, or the effect of the solar wind on the aurora of Saturn. Uh, and we can sort of begin to understand what effect the solar wind, which is coming out at and hitting the, the uh, magnetic environment of Saturn, what that does to the Saturn system. I remember reading a book written by Proctor about 100 years ago, when he thought there were set up as a kind of miniature sun with huge storms of vent heat on the surface. Well, that's not so, but there is plenty of internal heat there. There is certainly plenty of internal heat, and one of the big things, one of the big surprises, I suppose, about Saturn is the fact that there's about 80% more power than actually comes to it from the sun is, re is emitted by Saturn. So there's some processes uh, w which are going on inside, which are actually making that heat, driving the weather systems and those sorts of things. And I think the surprise about it is that this internal heat uh, is a source is actually larger in terms of percentage than that of Jupiter. So it's in something incredible is going on in there. And one of the things that I want to try and do with my instrument is measure what the magnetic field at Saturn is. That's generated deep in the interior. And if we understand better what the magnetic field measurements are, it almost allows us to see inside the planet and get an understanding about what's going on inside. Because one of the surprises at Saturn is it's very different to the Earth and Jupiter, for example, because its internal planetary field doesn't have a dipole tilt. The, the axis yes. of, the, of, the, of the field itself lies on top of the rotation. The pole and the magnetic pole are all the same. That's right. They essentially lie on top of each other. And planetary dynamo theory says that that can't be. If you're going to generate a magnetic field in the interior of a body, you need there to be a tilt between the dipole and the rotation axes. And so that's the, really the main question that I want to try and understand is where does Saturn's internal planetary field come from? How is it formed? And why does it look so different to those of the Earth and Jupiter? Well, we're talking about the interior of Saturn, and surely Cassini is going to help us there. Oh, of course it is. There are two instruments on board Cassini that will allow us to do that. One of them is my instrument, the magnetometer, which measures the internal planetary field. But also there's a gravity experiment on board, the radio science instrument. And the combination of those two, looking at the gravitational observations and the magnetic observations, will allow us to almost see inside the planet get an idea about how the two different planetary, well, the planetary field and the gravitational field form, and that will allow us to get a better understanding of the different processes that are taking place deep inside. The overall density of Saturn is very low, less than that of water, and it's rather a bland world compared with Jupiter. Why is that, do you think? Well, I wish we actually knew. Um, at Jupiter, we, what, we, what you ought to realize is we're really looking only at the upper atmosphere of the, of the planet. And so we know at Jupiter very trace 
quantities of various um, constituents of the atmosphere can give you this, this beautiful structure that you can see in, in uh, Jupiter. In the case of Saturn, the structure is there, but you've really got to process the images uh, to bring it out. Some storm systems, for example, you can see quite easily, but the, but the beautiful detail in the atmosphere really requires an intensive image processing to bring it out. So it is there, but you've really got to look at look for it. You do occasionally get outbreaks, and uh, way back in 1933, the white spots are covered by Will Hay of all people. I remember that very well. That's right. We know there are seasonal variations that these, these storm systems on Saturn, the great white spot and things, come and go, and they're connected with the, with the orbit of the planet. And that's the, the beauty of this mission, that we can actually be in orbit long enough to see some of the seasonal changes that will occur, not only on Saturn, but also, of course, on Titan. What we learned about Saturn we didn't know before? We've solved a few mysteries. Certainly, we, we can see in, in the F ring, for example, the way one of the small moons, Prometheus, orbiting just inside it is interacting and dragging stuff out from Pulling the Pulling material and away. Pulling material away. We can actually see this in the images. Then there is Dione with its strange wisps. Yes, Voyager saw this, these wisps of, of what we assumed was ice material on the surface of Dione, but we didn't get high enough resolution images, and we're already starting to get them with Cassini. And it turns out that these wisps material are actually cliffs of, of ice indicating some sort of tectonic activity on Dione. But Dione is quite small, only about 700 miles across. Yes, but we really don't understand where, you know, it, it's baffled most people with, that have seen this. We really don't understand this, the source of this tectonic activity because we would have thought this would be a pretty inert object. But this is one of the things that Cassini is going to look at when it gets closer to, to Dione later on in the mission. We've seen a Iapetus also, which appears to have mountains, a chain of mountains on it, which may be as high as, as 20 kilometers. This is an intriguing black and white moon, if you like, of, of Saturn. And then Enceladus, the possibly active satellite. Yes, that's another intriguing object. It has these smooth areas which suggest a, a young surface in places. It's also the, the peak of brightness of this um, very extensive E-ring, which is a diffuse ring composed of micron-sized material. So the E-ring appears to be composed of the same stuff that Enceladus is covered in, suggesting that perhaps Enceladus is the source of the E-ring material. So we really want to know what has happened on Enceladus. Have a, a really close look at that in, in detail with Cassini. The main thing, I suppose, this time was the landing upon Titan. Perhaps you know nothing. And Cassini is a vital part of that because that's got to send the material back. Absolutely. So far, there have been two very close flybys of Titan, um, and uh, and so it's been possible to look in advance what Titan is like. But then, yes, Cassini will play this very important role once the spacecraft actually gets there, because the primary thing will be to relay that data back to Earth. You um, got several years of work with Cassini, for not very many with Huygens. When Huygens lands on Titan, how long have you got before you lose contact? Well, it's about two and a half hours as the spacecraft floats down through the atmosphere and, uh, and then hopefully lands on the surface. And then there's up to a couple of hours when it, can, when it can work on the surface and send information back via the orbiter. So it's a very short mission compared to our much longer mission, which we have with Cassini. Um, and, but it is providing vital ground truth for the, for the measurements which are being made from the orbiter, which are remote sensing measurements, you know, the, inst the, uh, the imaging measurements, the infrared, ultraviolet, etc. It provides the ground truth for all of those and so we f are the, for the first time peering down beneath the surface but actually finding out what that surface is is what the probe is going to be able to do as well as look at the atmosphere itself which is remarkably like the Earth's early atmosphere. It's a very important mission. Well we should know soon because our uh, Huygens will land. Uh, will it come down on rock, on ice, on slush or will it plunge into a chemical ocean? What do you think Carl? I really wish I knew that's, <laughs> that's why we're, that's why we're sending Huygens. What we have seen with, with the images when we can peer through the, the sort of veil of, of Titan's atmosphere or these bright and dark regions and your, your eye automatically think, thinks of it as sort of coastline and you think therefore of, of fluids but we really don't know if there's any liquid on the surface. The, the, the suggestion is at the moment that there isn't but we really don't know what these bright and dark regions are. We see suggestions of east-west um, linear features that look similar to uh, dust streaks that have been seen on Mars, for example, which are produced by the wind and material blown by the wind in Mars' atmosphere. But what is going on on the surface of Titan, we really don't know. Are Titan's weather systems affected by the magnetic field of Saturn? Probably. 
One of the things that we want to try and understand is whether the atmosphere changes depending on whether Titan is in the magnetosphere of Saturn or whether it's out in the solar wind. And so it's very important that we know while the Huygens probe is traveling down through the atmosphere of Titan, where Cassini and Huygens are at the time. Because over the period of the Cassini mission, we need to try and understand how the atmosphere and the weather systems change depending on where Titan is. Because you have no idea where the probe will land on Titan yet. Have you? Um, we know sort of roughly where it's going to land, but we don't know precisely where it's going to land because, of course, the winds which are, which are going to be going during the, the descent, it's difficult to actually predict those. We've got some idea of which general direction the wind goes um, from the images so far, but we can't predict exactly where it's going to land. So one of the exciting things about the Huygens mission is it seems to be, it, I mean, it, it's actually sort of directed to be landing uh, in an area which is in between one of these sort of dark and, uh, and bright features. So it could land in either, so it really could be... Uh, could be either possibility. Well, one question is going to be asked. I think I know the answer, so do you. People are going to say, is there any chance of any life there? Most likely not, because, of course, the temperature is extremely low, minus 180 degrees centigrade. So this is near the, the triple point of methane, which means when methane exists as a solid, liquid and gas. Um, and so this is why people have had the idea that there may be liquid methane and hydrocarbons on the surface, because of that. Because methane is in the atmosphere, it's a small constituent of the atmosphere, it's mainly nitrogen. But um, uh, there are hydrocarbons in, the, in that environment. And one of the sort of big surprises that Cassini has found so far is by looking high in the atmosphere um, during, the, during one of the early encounters, it actually found lots of hydrocarbons higher than we expected in the atmosphere and quite complex hydrocarbons. So the look, understanding that hydrocarbon chemistry which is going on and seeing the effect which it will have on the surface, that is one of the important things we can do. So it seems to be a very young surface uh, because there are very few craters, if any, um, on the surface. And so the, the, the uh, amount of cratering there is, is very low. So it's a young surface and um, it hasn't, uh, it's, so it's been modified recently and this is one of the interesting things and looking at the role of the hydrocarbons in that is going to be something which is very exciting to work out. Now I wonder, what other surprises are we going to get? Do you think we're going to get any soon? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> what do you think? I'm well, I'm particularly interested to see what the surface of Titan is like, but I'm also interested in some of the close flybys we're going to have to the icy satellites in the future. But focusing in on Titan, I think one of the surprises that I didn't expect was the fact that you can see changes taking place in the atmosphere. There were some, some high-level clouds observed on the TA flyby, which seem to have almost disappeared on the TB flyby. There are still clouds there, but they are very different to what they were before. And so there is weather taking place in Titan's atmosphere. And one of the things the Huygens probe is going to allow us to do is to understand a little bit better how that weather actually forms. So many questions. I think in a few days now, we may know the answer to at least some of them. Michelle, Andrew, Carl, thank you very much. Well, Huygens is on its way. It will land upon Titan on January the 14th, and I hope answer some of the questions. Meanwhile, if you want your newsletter, send your stamp to this envelope to newsletter number 96, Sky at Night, BBC Birmingham, mailbox B11RF. So, until next month, good night. You can see an extended version of this program over on BBC4, Bank Holiday Monday night at 8.